Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to Rich Reviews, and welcome back to my beautiful 458 Spider. Quite a few people are interested in buying a 458 nowadays, whether it be because the 458 are last of the naturally aspirated V8s, or whether it's because of the actual situation we're in. We've got this bubble situation where potentially the prices have been inflated a little bit anyway, over and above the car being sought after being because of the last naturally aspirated V8. So to that end, people are interested in how they should actually buy this car. What should they be looking out for on the car? What options should they be, be looking for on the car? In general, how should they go about buying a 458 Spider? So today, we're going to do a Rich Reviews Buyer's Guide. First of all, when considering buying a 458, my recommendation is you buy from a dealer. Also, you've got the actual options where you can buy privately from a private seller. Now, obviously buying from a private seller, that has its pros and cons. The cons being that you don't really, you haven't got the, the backup from an actual dealership, which isn't so good. In my opinion, and in my strong opinion, you really need to be buying these cars from dealerships wherever possible, unless you're very, very well experienced in purchasing cars and you really know what you're doing and you really know these cars well. Um, if somebody was gonna sell one of these cars and it had a problem with it, they'd sell it as a private seller. It'd never go to a dealer because a dealer would pick it up. So my, my recommendation would be to buy a 458 from a Ferrari dealer. So I'm gonna split the buyer's guide down into two sections. The first section will deal with what you should be looking out for on a used car. So um, anomalies that they were maybe on the car, wear and tear anomalies, maybe possible accident damage, etc. cetera. Um, and the second part of the, of the video will be talking about the actual options that you should be looking out for, whether it be for yourself that are nice options to have or options for resale. So Ferraris are actually made out of aluminium. They have an aluminium body and an aluminium chassis. Now, what does that mean? Now, contrary to popular belief, they can corrode. They don't rust, but they can corrode. Now, what does that mean? Well, if the, if the aluminium oxide layer that is on top of aluminium, if that layer is, is damaged in some way or it depletes or it gets depleted, then you can get corrosion or oxidization. Aluminium oxidizes. That means you can actually get some corrosions on, the, on these cars. And the main element of corrosion was actually around the wheel arches. So it has been known for the wheel arches, whether it be the fore or after the wheel arches, to actually bubble and corrode. It's quite easily remedied, but obviously it's costly. Good old Ferrari tax. Now the area that they actually go is commonly around these areas, which, are, which is common to be hit by moisture, commonly hit by moisture and obviously gravel thrown up because it's the wheel arch, it's, it's the area that's most susceptible to damage and most susceptible to moisture from the road. And also the front section of the wheel arch as well. On the rear wheel arches, they're very well, very well known to corrode around this area. They actually bubble around this area. And now with regards to where gravel is thrown up aggressively from the rear of the tires and you get a lot of gravel rash underneath this particular section. Many people may remember the Top Gear episode where Richard Hammond actually had a 458. It was a 458 Spider as well. They'd set up a drag strip on a Spanish runway, on a Spanish aircraft runway. And when he'd been going up and down the road multiple times obviously they must have done multiple shoots it was thrown up a lot of gravel a lot of rubbish onto the back of the car and it wore away a lot of this section of the car as well as some of the under, under underbody panels as well so it's actually a good denoter of how hard a 458 has been driven because if this section is heavily worn away then you can tell it's actually maybe not commensurate with the actual mileage that the car has so look out look for that section on, on the rear of the rear, on the rear wheel arch, it's at the bottom of the rear wheel arch, look for that, look for wear on that section. As you can see, mine's in very good condition. It's one of the things I looked out for when I bought the car. Not all 458s corrode, only a few of them. And for some reason it hits some cars and it doesn't hit others, who knows why. Um, mine's been fine. Um, Damien from the Car Guys, for example, all his four wheel arches on his 2015 458 Italia, all of them corroded on his, on his white. Bianco Fuji coloured um, 458 Italia. The actual corrosion was quite bad on this car and that's the same year as this car, it's a 2015 458. So 
you know, it hasn't obviously affected my car, thankfully, um, but it can affect some cars. So how can you help yourself? So what you can do is, um, for example, when you wash the car, make sure you dry it properly. At some point, I'm gonna give you a proper dryer's guide to actually go through how to dry the car properly. Now, a lot of you will be thinking, hell, what the hell's he on about? You just flip and dry the car. No, you don't. <laughs> if you want the car to stay in this sort of condition, you wash it in a certain way and you dry it in a certain way. You dry it with certain cloths in a certain way and you dry areas in a certain way. And you make sure you don't let moisture sit on the car, but that's gonna be the subject for a, for a different video. So what else to look out for? Well, I'm a bit of a pedantic person. I'm quite anal. Um, I actually um, asked if I could take a paint depth gauge to the dealership and I actually measured the paint depth on, on all of the panels. Now, why did I do that? Well, because it's a good way of telling if the actual car has been resprayed in certain areas. Now, if you've got PPF on the car, my, my car previously had PPF on the front, but just on the front bonnet and part of the wing, you can't measure through PPF. There's no gauges that would measure through PPF because obviously it's an electronic process. You measure the depth of the paint in microns. But most of my car wasn't PPF at the time, so I could measure the, the actual, most of the panels. And it came, as long as you've got paint depths that are, aren't over a certain depth, and that they're, all the paint measurements, all the paint depth measurements are pretty much around the same area, give or take a certain percentage. Now, different cars have different percentage of paint depths. Ferraris typically have quite thin paint and it does deviate quite a bit across a panel. So you have to take that in mind. Different cars that may alert people to something, but may, with different cars, it may alert people to, to an issue. But with regards to Ferraris, that's fine. As long as the paint depth isn't over a certain level of microns, then you're, you're talking about the, the, probably that the panel has been resprayed and of course they won't have taken it back to bare metal. They've put more depth of paint on top of the panel. Hence, you can tell if it's had paint on it. Now, maybe it's because I'm too pedantic. Um, a lot of people don't actually check this, but one of the other things that I checked on the car was that the actual, that each of the pane, pane of glass in the car, each piece of glass in the car has the actual Ferrari Cavallino, the actual prancing horse. This actually depicts that it's proper OEM Ferrari glass. Now, OEM means original equipment manufacturer, and it means that it is actually supplied by Ferrari. There's many um, glass repair companies that will actually say they're gonna provide OEM glass or original equipment manufactured glass, and they don't. This windscreen, the glass alone, is very close to, if not a little bit more nowadays, than 3,000 pounds, 3,000 English pounds, just for the glass. So obviously many of these actually companies that do glass repair, they won't actually provide, that, or they won't want to spend that money because your excess will be something like 100 pounds on, on a windscreen repair. They won't want to fork out 3,000 pounds for the actual glass. So it's very important when you sort out your insurance that you make sure you've got um, built into the insurance policy is that they will actually replace any panes of glass with proper Ferrari glass and when you actually purchase the car you look for these Cavallino prancing horses which denotes proper Ferrari glass. If we look at the actual side window here you can see there the Cavallinos there are evident. It's evident on all panes of glass. It's, it's evident on um, both the side windows, the actual rear compartment window which you can move up and down that gives you sounds of the engine and obviously on the windscreen as I've already denoted. So for me that's quite important. It actually if somebody's going to check that when they when they purchase a car if you don't have it on the car then either you correct it and you fit you replace the glass in effect to make sure it does have it before you sell the car or potentially if somebody knows what they're looking for they may they may want you to drop the price because of that with regards to tools ferraris have two sets of tools obviously it's important that the ferrari actually has the t both toolkits supplied with the car there's a little pamphlet section behind this toolkit which enables you to put the slot the manual in there the other toolkit section is actually the inflator for the car, the tire inflator. So it's a compressor in there, an air compressor. It's important to have both these um, available with the car. And as you can see below, yes, we've got, we've got the Tesco shopping bags there, but as you can see below also the car cover with the bag that, that, the, that uh, encapsulates the car cover as well. So the proper bag for the cover, car cover, the car cover. And within that bag should also be the original OEM battery conditioner with the Ferrari branding on it. Little point of note, when closing the hood, fist like so, on the badge, light pressure. 
don't give it a slam, don't bang it down. This is an aluminium panel, you don't want to bend it. So moving on the inside of the car now. This has got the race seats. We're, we're going to get onto the options in a minute, but the actual seats shouldn't have too much of a sheen on them. If they've got a sheen on them, that's what's called patina. And what that patina actually means is that the car has had wear. Now there's nothing wrong with the car having wear, as long as the wear and tear on the car is commensurate with the actual mileage on the car. So if the car is touted as being very low mileage, but the actual seats have quite a bit of patina on them, quite a lot of shine, um, or you know, a bit of wear and tear, a bit of fraying around the bolsters, especially around here, then I would question the mileage. And apparently these cars have two mileometers. They have one main mileometer, which is actually exists in the dash. And they have another one I've been told that is hidden away an electronic mileometer in the actual gearbox. So they can actually, Ferrari can tally the two together. So if you use a mileage inhibitor on these cars, you've got to be very careful because Ferrari can tally it from the gearbox and see that the mileage has been fixed. So that's something to, to, to be mindful of. So make sure that the wear and tear of the car, especially the interior, is commensurate with the actual mileage that the car is showing, especially if you're buying privately. So another area of wear that is noticeable on the car is on the steering wheel. If this is shiny or if or if there's any wear evident on this steering wheel in any way, it should look like this if it's low mileage. Obviously the car should look like this if your car's a low mileage. You could get a lot of patina around this area where people's hands have been on the, on the lever a lot and it's actually put a lot of oil into the lever, a lot of um, grease from the actual skin from humans, from our hands, etc., from using the steering wheel. So be mindful of that and obviously wear and tear around the, the, um, wear and tear around the steering wheel as well. Now another area, and um, while we're here, that is something to look out for is the wing mirrors these are auto auto wing mirrors so they're electronically controlled with regards to changing the mirror directions and folding them in you can you've got this knob here which actually folds the mirrors in and out these knobs break quite easily so when you're using it, you have to be very careful when you're using it to make sure you don't push hard on it and, it, and it, because it will snap and that means you've got to take this front section out you've got to buy a new knob and you're into ferrari tax of course so try and avoid it be be gentle with the car uh, be sympathetic with the car don't try and use it roughly and make sure that that hasn't been snapped off now that would be an obvious thing if it snapped but you'd be surprised what people may try and hide in a private cell there's many other knobs which are thin like that for example on the stereo on uh, and on the systems that manage the right screen this knob for example they also snap so be mindful that they haven't been glued on that they are quite solid um, but you know with regards with their that they haven't been glued obviously they're, they're not very solid as you can see that's just you know an inherent design weakness but make sure that they haven't been snapped off and then quickly super glued back on again now all these items i'm talking about they're pretty much whether you're buying privately or from a dealer because you need to check these things if you're buying from a dealer as well um, if you buy privately now i recommend you get a ppi of course you don't necessarily need a ppi if you're going to buy from a ferrari dealer because you're covered by their warranty one of the other sections that's quite important is tyres. Now these tyres are quite expensive and it's, it's not uncommon for a car to have its original tyres if it's low mileage. This car is only done, had only done 5,150 miles when I bought the car and it's on its original 2015 tyres. So there's two things you need to look out for. You need to look out for the wear of the, on the tyre because these are expensive to buy and you need to look out for the age on the tyres. Now there is a marker on here that denotes the actual age. I think it's along here. I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't actually read it. But I know that these, the age of these tires is 2015. So you have to be careful because if you've got very old tires, then it's going to affect the tire performance. So after a certain age, the tires need replacing. Now you can tell if they're severely aged and if they need aggressively replacing, if you've got any wear markings, any cracking along the sidewall of the tire, that denotes that the tires definitely need to be changed. These look fantastic and, and they're fine, but I will have to change these in probably six months to a year because they are getting quite old now. Even though the, the actual wear on the tires is fine, there's still plenty of meat left on the tires. The Ferrari, the 458 actually is the last supercar, the last Ferrari mid-engine supercar that implements the old style keys where you actually put a key into the ignition. You should be provisioned with two of these keys for a 458. If you're not, then you need to ask for them. Now that's obviously again for a private sale or from a dealership, no problems from a dealership, I'm sure. Now also what comes with these keys is what's called a key card. 
This key card provides the serial number and specification of this key. You can't get another key made or you can't order a new key from Ferrari without that key card. So make sure you've got that key card. My key card was still with the previous owner. So I had to request that key card it had been forgotten about. No problems, it wasn't the dealer's fault, they just something that had been missed. But you've got to be vigilant, you've got to make sure you check these things and you're aware of these sort of situations and these items. Otherwise, you know, if you try and ask for them six months or a year down the line, it's all going to be forgotten about and it's going to be a nightmare to try and get hold of. Better to make sure it's there before you hand your money over. Now you've got to make a decision when you buy these cars whether or not you're happy for them to, be tr to have been tracked or not. If you don't want the car to have been tracked, so if you want to buy a non-tracked car, then you need to do certain checks. And obviously the first thing is to ask the owner if it's been tracked or the dealer. I'm sure the dealer will be honest anyway. I know my car hadn't been tracked. The, the, the previous owner was, was very fastidious and all the owners actually been very fastidious, very, very well looked after. The dealership had dealt with this car all the way through its life, apart from the original purchase. But after about a thousand miles, it'd been dealt with by, by the dealership I bought the car from. And so I, I, I know, and I did certain checks afterwards as well. Okay, so how can you check if the car's been tracked? If you told the car, if you've been told the car hasn't been tracked, how can you check? Now, track, uh, the Italia is more likely to be tracked than the actual spider, but spiders are still tracked sometimes. How you can check is the usual thing, uneven wear on the tires, across the actual width of the tire. Now, if the tire's been changed, you could ask the question, why have they been changed? Yeah, of course, it could be because the actual tires are worn. Um, but if it's low mileage and the tyres have been changed, you could ask, well, why have they been changed? Also, as I detailed before, with the situation with um, Richard Hammond, you get, the, you get a lot of gravel thrown up when cars are, on a, are being raced against each other or are on a track. So the, the wheels will throw up a lot of gravel and you'll get a lot of gravel rash around this area and particularly this area of the car. As you can see mine are immaculate. You'll get a lot of gravel rash around this area if it's been tracked quite a bit and potentially behind the actual wheel arch guards you'll get a lot of gravel behind there or you can get a gravel build up behind there and behind here so you could ask for these for these wheel arch um, guards to actually be removed so you can have a look behind them to see if there's a build up of gravel but if this has been sprayed again paint depth gauge will tell you whether or not this has been sprayed um, if, it, if it looks immaculate um, then and you think the car's been tracked, then have a look behind the panels or check the paint depth. If, you, if the car's low mileage and the rest of the car is commensurate with the mileage, then you're pretty, pretty much you're okay if this hasn't got a lot of gravel rash on it. You may get some gravel rash on there anyway, naturally from driving, but if the car's been tracked, you're gonna get quite a bit of gravel rash there. So that would be a denoter of whether or not the car's been tracked or not. And you'll get, you know, could get wear on the, on the wheels as well, but people may change the wheels and, you know, if they're going to change to track tires, etc. as well. One of the things that's very expensive to replace on this car is the rotors or the discs because they're, they're ceramic, they're CCDs, carbon ceramic discs. Now these discs should be, again, if you've got a low mileage car, they should be commensurate with the mileage. If the car's been tracked, then the discs will be showing somewhere from being tracked. The way how these discs get ruined is excessive track wear and if they're not allowed to cool off for a cool off lap after a particular track session. Now there's no harm if a car's been tracked as long as you know it's been tracked and that the brakes have been looked after. Um, it's around £20,000 to change the rotors on these cars to change all of them. So, you know, that's, uh, that's a bitter pill to swallow if you've got to foot that bill after you've just bought one of these. So it's an important thing to look out for. Now, if you're buying from a dealer, there's some information that's held in the ECU, which gives you a, a, a wet finger approach, percentage of wear for the rotors. So make sure you ask the dealer for a percentage of wear. Uh, when I bought this car, it had 1% of wear on the rotors from the ECU. And that's obviously, the ECU gives that information relative to how hard the car's been driven and the mileage the car's got. So um, how many miles the car's been driven and, and how hard the car's been driven. So it's important to check to make sure that your rotors are sound. If you're at all concerned, then make sure you get a PPI performed of the car and that, that, that inspection actually focuses on the rotors of the car in addition to everything else. So make sure that they do check the rotors and they know what they're looking at when they check the rotors to see if they're, if they're worn or if they're gonna be need replacing within the next six months to a year or maybe two years. I mean, to be honest, these rotors are supposed to last the life of the car if they're looked after. 
So you shouldn't be footing the bill to replace the rotors for the life of the car unless there's been an issue or unless the car's been driven super hard. Now there's items you need to be aware of also when you're driving the car. If you're buying from a dealer, the car's gonna drive well, I'm sure of it. I'll be honest with you now, I never test drove this car before I bought it. I test drove another 458 from the dealership before I bought it, so I knew exactly what a 458 should feel like. Obviously that's vital, but I never actually test drove this car. Now you'd think that's balmy. Well, if you know the dealership, they're not gonna fiddle you on the car. The car's gonna drive exceptionally well, it was very low mileage. So I had no qualms that there's gonna be any issue with this car. But if you're buying privately, for sure, and if you're buying from a dealership, you need to take at least A458 out. Um, but if you're buying from, um, if you're buying privately, then you need to check certain things are all operating. So for example, this car's got the advanced front lighting system. What does that mean? Well, that's got to be provisioned when you've got lift because this car's got lift. You also have to have the AFS advanced front lighting system included in the options. Now that's really good. What does that mean? Well, the advanced front, light, front lighting system, if you look at my options video, I'll give you more details, means that the actual lights follow the steering wheel. So when you're driving around, um, the lights will move in the direction that you change the steering wheel to because it perceives that where you change the steering wheel to, that's where your eyes will be going because that's where the car's going to be going. So obviously, so obviously that's where the lights need to be. When you're out driving the car, you need to check things like that. So you need to look at what options the car has, how those options should work and make sure they do function. So make sure the lights do turn with the steering wheel. Make sure, for example, if you've got a electrochromatic mirrors, um, which gives you the folding, the automatic folding mirrors option, make sure the mirrors do fold in and out with the, with the switch to make sure that's functioning. All these things can be very expensive, expensive to replace and make sure if the car's got lift, the lift does work and it operates correctly. We're now going to move on to my, rec my recommendations for the options list. So what options should you be choosing as a bare minimum? And again, this is just my opinion um, and this is for your comfort, for the car to be uh, desirable and to be nice and for you to enjoy the car and for obviously for resale as well. So let's get on to the overseeing items, so the, so the key items. What colour should you have? Now, it's up to you what colour you want. Now, mine is Rosso Corsa, which is also called Resale Red. Beautiful other colours that you can get this car in, which are great for resale as well, is Rosso, um, is Rosso Fuoco, and also you've got Giallo Modena. Those colours are, are stunning and they're great for resale, and they're beautiful to have the car in. You won't get that money back for those cars, so those those colors those special triple layer colors cost a lot of extra money so they're high optioned they're, they're a highly expensive option um so you have to be aware that if you're trying to if you pay a lot more for the car because of those colors you're not likely to get that money back on a resale rosso fuoco for example is around seventeen thousand pounds as an option um, from the factory so obviously it's very expensive so expect to pay a bit more for the car if you've got those sort of special colors with regards to the interior i went for nero so Nero is black. Um, black is a nice easy colour. It doesn't show wear so much. And also you can get in and out of the car with jeans on and the jeans, if they do, if the colour from jeans does leach into the leather, you're not going to notice it. If you have a, an interior colour um, of crema, for example, then if you're using jeans quite a lot, you've got to be so careful because the, the colour, the dye from jeans will bleed into the crema on the seats. So you're constantly going to have to have the seats cleaned or you're going to have to make sure that you, you don't wear jeans that bleed the, the dye into the, into the seat colour. My recommendations for the interior colour would be Nero, Cuero or um, Crema. But I actually personally, I wouldn't go for Crema because it's just a nightmare to keep clean, but it's very good for resale. Um, Cuero is better for resale in my opinion, um, but Nero is great as well for the reasons I've already, I've already detailed. For people that don't know, Quio is beige or tan. By the way, I'm reading from a list because it's just a lot easier to do so. And this is the minimum spec list. So this isn't necessarily a definitive list. This is actually a minimum spec list. What my recommendations would be that um, you should have as a minimum spec. So if you move around to the car, I would also recommend that um, the Ferrari shields are a minimum essential requirement. So make sure you've got the Ferrari shield. If you're looking for, to make sure that you've got the original Ferrari shields, OEM Ferrari shields, and make sure the actual wing has got the indentation in for the shield. Earlier cars didn't have that. When I say earlier cars, I mean earlier Ferraris, not earlier 458s, all 458s should have the shields in that manner if they've been optioned. If they haven't been optioned, then it's a real problem with resale because people will expect that. It's a real big um, requirement on 
um, when people look for these cars. Almost, I haven't seen any 458 that hasn't got those shields in, so you'll, you'll be okay. It's, it's almost certain they're gonna have the Ferrari shields there, but something to keep an eye on. The other thing to look out for as well on this minimum spec is 20 inch forged rims or diamond cut rims. So it's important to make sure that the actual wheels are forged rims, 20 inch forged rims. Again, almost all of these Ferraris have 20 inch forged rims, so you should be okay, but it's important to check the original options. What you don't get on the 458, of course, is the options in the boot compartment, in, in the actual um, rear compartment, storage compartment, as you do with the 488 onwards. It actually, they didn't have that with the, with the 458, uh, unfortunately. Um, it's from the 488 onwards, so that would have been a lot easier if you had that. Now, moving again into, to the inside of the car. Very important, as you can see here, mine's got it, to have the actual carbon fiber driving zone. Now, what is the carbon fiber driving zone? The carbon, the carbon fiber driving zone is the steering wheel in carbon fiber. So you can see here, this section carbon fiber, the driving LEDs, the paddles in carbon fiber, as opposed to aluminum, and this section of the ref counter in carbon fiber. So that's called the carbon fiber driving zone. That's called the driving zone package. Now there is another package you can get with this car, another interior carbon fiber package you can get with this car um, that is, has a dependency on you having carbon fiber race seats. You can only have that package if you have the carbon fiber race seats. You can spec it out individually, but you can only have this group of items as a whole if you have carbon fiber racing seats and that package, I can't remember the name of it, that provides the rest of the carbon fiber. So it makes sure you've got the vents, and the actual strip in the center section in the passenger area in carbon fiber. You can option those separately, but this particular package gives you that as well. And carbon fiber on the center console. The race package also provides you with the carbon fiber center console. It's not an essential requirement, it's a nice to have. I wouldn't put it as a, as a minimum essential requirement, um, as minimum spec essential requirement, but it's a nice to have. Most people look for that. If you've got carbon fiber vents, um, and you've got the carbon fiber racing zone, or you've got the carbon fiber package which incorporates all of that, then it will include the actual center console as well. So, um, and also, also you can spec out, or you can have um, a very rare that these side panels, which is called the upper console section, these upper sections can be in carbon fiber as well. So, which provides this carbon fiber side strip. In most cars, that's leather. It's very rare to have it in carbon fiber. As you can see, mine's in carbon fiber, which is a really nice option. I was very lucky to get the option spec. I was very lucky to get this car with the options list it has, but that's a very nice to have. But as I said, it's not an essential requirement to have the center console in carbon fiber. It's a nice to have. Also, it's a nice to have electrochromatic mirrors. I would say it's, it's, it's a great option to have. It provides dulling of the mirrors when you've got bright lights hitting them, when you've got cars behind you, for example, on bright lights. Um, it's, it's a lot, it takes away eye strain, makes the car a lot easier to drive at night. And it provides a nice thicker rear view mirror as well, which I think looks a lot better than the thinner version that's provided if you don't have electrochromatic mirror um, spec option. I think this mirror, this rear view mirror looks a lot better than the thin version that is provisioned for the non-chromatic mirror option. Now, as I, as I intimated earlier, another option on my minimum spec is carbon fiber race seats. Now this is a biggie. Carbon fiber race seats is a biggie for the options list. This is, I would say around, I'd even go as high as 90% of people who look for a 458, they look for a 458 with the carbon fiber racing seat options as opposed to the comfort seats. It's just what people look for. It was one of my prerequisites. It was essential for me to have carbon fiber race seats in my car. Um, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. And these seats are really comfortable and they may seem quite thin, which they are, and quite lightweight, but they're really comfortable. Yes, you don't get the electronic options that you get with the comfort seats. Um, you have to manually move the, move the seat forwards and backwards with a rail on the front. Um, and you, with regards to raising the seat, you can't raise the passenger seat. You can only raise the driver's seat and you, you have to raise it by changing the settings manually by unbolting the part of the frame to actually move the seat up and down. You've got three options for the height. You've got three options for the height on the driver's seat, but it's well worth it just to have these things of beauty. I mean, they're, they're just a beautiful seat, the beautiful design, very comfortable. And uh, they're standing and they, they really, 
they really make the car, in my opinion, especially a Spider. You've got the roof off, you want to see the carbon fiber seats. One of the items that is a nice to have, but isn't essential is lift. So again, not, not an essential item, but nice to have. You can see here, this button denotes you've got lift. It allows the front to, to lift up a bit if you've got sleeping policemen that you want to get over. But to be honest, these cars are high enough at the front anyway. They're not very low. And most people want front and rear parking sensors. I find them quite annoying, but most people want them. And you can see those here with these little sections for the sensors that are put into the front bumper and across to the other side. And the similar on the actual rear of the car, you've got those sensors built in as well. One of the items in additionally that um, and I believe should be in minimum specification is the, is the rear camera, is the rear reversing camera. The rear reversing camera, I, it wasn't an essential item for me. Um, but it is for a lot of people. I've known people to request that the rear camera is retrofitted. Now, if you've retrofit this rear camera, you've got to replace the whole rear bumper because that section cannot be put in to a, to a rear bumper that does not have the rear camera option by design. Minimum spec, another minimum spec item is what's called the radio navi system. Now, this is mostly for resale because <laughs> The controllers that manage this and the interface to the, uh, to the radio navi system is awful. But it's something that people do look for and do request. Most people use an Inverie unit or a Bovi unit, to, uh, to, which is a Bluetooth unit, to stream, to stream music to this system. But if you have the system, then you can do that. And, and one of the other things that's essential as well, in my opinion, is what's called the iPod connectivity. Now, iPod connectivity is very old style iPod connectivity. It provisions a 30 pin socket in the glove box and it enables you to fit either a Bovi or an Inverie, um, Air Dual Inverie unit um, to be able to stream your music from your iPhone to the unit or obviously from an Android phone. So those, those are, that's an essential requirement, iPod, iPod connectivity and radio sat nav. The sat nav on this, by the way, is, is great to look at, but the controls on it are abysmal. One of the other items that is essential that you have on the car, but it's not essential, you have this particular item, and that is a navi system. So it's actually a sat navigational tracker system, and this is one of the trackers. This is a Ferrari tracker system, and this is one of the trackers that you have with the system. You can see there the, the LED flashing. This helps you with insurance. Many insurance companies will not insure you unless the car has a tracker and obviously the tracker is enabled. Okay, now moving on to um, one of the last items now here is colored calipers. Now, colored cal calipers depends on the, the type of base color you have on the car, the external color you have on the car. My recommendation would be if you're going for Rosso Corsa then to have yellow brake calipers. A lot of people choose red brake calipers. That's fine. For me, I prefer yellow. And if whatever brake calipers your colors you're going with, I would recommend that you go for the same color in the speedo option as well. My speedo option, the base background color is, is yellow, which is perfect for me. And like I say, I was very lucky with the option of the, on this car, but, but that can commonly be red as well. And it's nice to have them, two of them tallying together. It's not essential, but it's a nice to have. Uh, another essential requirement I would recommend is the B posts in carbon fiber too. So that's quite an important requirement. So if I was going to quickly buzz through those items that I believe is an essential requirement for a minimum spec, I would say the, driving, the, the driver's racing zone in carbon fiber or the racing package, which provides all the actual sections in the dash. The um, carbon fiber race seats, very, very important to have carbon fiber race seats. Yellow calipers or colored calipers to match in and tying with the with the external color of the car and the rev counter color of the car essential to have the shields reversing camera a lot of people choose that and it's a very good item for resale so if you're looking to make the car very resellable or easy to resell then reversing camera and the color specifications as i've already said um, triple layer yellow, triple, triple layer red, or Rosso Corsa, um, and also with regards to the interior, Crema, Nero, Nero, or Cuyo, which is tan, black, or cream, cream white. That pretty much um, sums it up. Um, there's various other options as well. My car is very highly optioned. 
you know, with regards to carbon fiber on the back, um, what they used to call the challenge grill. So carbon fiber on the rear grill, I wouldn't say that's essential. That can be body color. That's not an essential requirement. It's a nice to have, but not an essential requirement. So those items there that I've covered off, they're what I would say to be the minimum specification um, for, for a car if you want to have obviously a, a nice car and have a car that's gonna be more easy to resell on. So that's the Rich Reviews 458 Buyer's Guide. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope a lot of that resonates with people who have already bought their 458s. Maybe there's some items on there that you're thinking, hell, I wish I'd flipping chosen those, or, or maybe you'd wish you'd had some insight into that information beforehand. Hopefully it helps potential 458 buyers um, going forward in the future to purchase their cars. If you like the content, then please make sure you give the video a like, give it a thumbs up. Some great content to come. We've got some great um, reviews coming of a, a fantastic car cover, and also for the Forza Compliciano, um, exhaust valve controller for this car and that of both of those um, where the Forza controller will be covering off the the configuration the installation and the actual operation of that unit um, that's something to come in the future so make sure that you're subscribed if you're not subscribed already to be able to catch that content going forward we're looting the light now so I'm going to sign off the video and close it out thanks a lot for watching guys and we'll see you in the next video